president asked me if I'd run the dining hall. And so I hired all the people, brought the menus, ordered the food, did the payroll, whatever had to be done. And uh, my second year there, uh, in comes Peggy Davis from Lund, Georgia, and I signed her to wait on tables. And uh, I can't say that I was impressed with the way she waited on tables, but I was impressed with how she looked, and so we started dating. Do you want to tell us about your first impressions of Bob? He makes that sound so simple. Um, and he makes it sound rosier than it really was, because I walked in and this old gray-haired man was sitting there, and he had on washed out blue jeans and he had on a white t-shirt uh, with the sleeves rolled up and a pencil behind his ear. And he thought he was really important and I did not like the way he acted. I didn't like the way he spoke. Uh, I didn't like the way all these returning uh, students were coming back and they come in and they say, Oh, Bobby! And it was just a Bobby, Bobby, and it was a big to do. And I thought, who in the world, or what in the world does he think he is? I thought he was about the smuggest, most smart aleck person I had ever seen, and I took an instant dislike to him. Well, if you instantly disliked him, how did you date him? Well, we didn't date for a long time. That was early September, and we had our first date the 23rd of October. Why did it take you so long, Bob, to take her out? Well, my calendar was fully booked up until then. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, the arrogance here. Did see, you like that? See what I meant about the short <laughs> To be really frank with you, Judy, I had uh, eight jobs while I was going to school full time, so I was quite busy with a lot of things and didn't have a lot of money in those days, although I ended up uh, graduating from college with an old car and about uh, $1,500 in the bank, so it didn't do too bad. And frankly, I asked uh, Peggy a couple of times to go out and she wasn't very interested. Uh, what she forgot to tell you was that in those days, Georgia Teachers was very strict. You had to sign out, you had to be back in the dormitory at a certain time, and you could only go to certain places and whatever. And either because I didn't attend my first two years there, or because frankly I didn't care, I didn't particularly care for the rules and regulations because I had a little bit of time, and when I had time, I wanted to do something I wanted to do. And I remember we went out one time to a restaurant and we got uh, halfway through the meal. Peggy hadn't eaten very much and I asked her why and she was nervous somebody would see her. She was one of the places you weren't supposed to go. And I said, well, oh, we've it got a restaurant. I mean, what the hell? You're not supposed to go there. <laughs> you mean they had certain places you could and couldn't go? Oh, yes. Such a... Uh, what was that restaurant? I think it was a, attached to a hotel or something and you know they were all nervous and jerky about that kind of stuff so that's the reason we weren't supposed to be there and she was very nervous about it and we said well we'll just leave and go somewhere else Judy the younger generation had no concept of how strict the school was and uh, you had a house mother and you had to adhere to all these directions uh, you couldn't go anywhere unless you signed out. The only place you could go without signing out was to go to class. Where did you live? In D.C. Hall? I lived in West Hall. West Hall. And um, it turned out to be a good experience living in West Hall. And But we all had to be in by a certain time every night. And we always closed with vespers in the evening. And everybody had to be present for that unless you were deathly ill and in the hospital or something. Um, but let's get back to this going out business. Um, I had a crushes on two or three of the boys on campus. And they would come through the, li through the line and would kind of linger talking to me. And of course, the minute that this one saw them talking to me, he was there looking over my shoulder and saying, um, I think you need to go do something else or something else, you know. He, he kind of arranged that. Oh, I wasn't paying to talk to boys. I was paying to serve food or clean up tables. 
anyway, our first date was the 23rd of October. And uh, I, I didn't, I knew that we were double dating with another couple, um, one of his friends and her date who was also older. And we found out to go see a movie. And um, the movie we went to see was not, I just signed out of the school to go see a movie. We ended up going to a drive-in movie. We saw, it was October the 23rd, and we saw um, a movie called Dancing in the Dark. Bob was quite a dancer, and um, he taught me a lot about dancing, and we really did enjoy that kind of activity. But I'm sure that the house mother would have been on my head the next day if she had known we had gone to the drive-in movie. There was a car that you go in. To boot. He had an old 35 Chevrolet that the doors opened in the front and uh, one door was locked. You had to crawl across the seat to get, to get over on the right hand <laughs> side. Well. And so that, uh, we, he, we had wheels, but uh, that was our first date. And uh, I did really- you, Did you date him exclusively after that? Yes, pretty much. Um, I still was interested in a couple of other boys, but um, our relationship kind of moved along and I guess the thing that really sold me on him is that he was brave enough, you know, he was an Irish Catholic, a city boy, uh, had gray hair and was a senior and I was a lowly freshman and when he showed up unexpected, we had, we went home for Christmas break and Mama and Daddy and I were standing out in front of the house looking at some of the flowers Mama had growing. And here came, driving up the dusty road, was this old gray-haired man in his 35 Chevrolet. And he hopped, I didn't know it was coming, I knew nothing about it. He hops out of the car and uh, runs over and picks me up and swings me around and gives me a kiss. And I thought, oh my God, he is going to be killed right on the spot. And I just we <laughs> brothers stop him doing that. None of the brothers, but Daddy gave him a look that would have just driven him right through the ground. And he took on all of David's clan that weekend when he was there, and um, he weathered those okay. And I figured anybody that was brave enough to wade into all the Davises and uh, their biases about religion and his gray hair and the Irish city boy, I figured he was a-okay. So after that, I really, uh, I didn't mind being pursued and I pursued myself, did I not? You did. Okay. How did and the propose? thing that really sealed that uh, holiday season was Mrs. Davis had a pie safe over in the corner by the table. And I'd never seen a pie safe, and I asked her, well, what is this? And she said, it's a pie safe. And I said, you lock pies up in it? And she said, no, no, you just open the door. And when I opened the door, I think it had four or five shelves. And on each shelf, there were three, maybe four pies. And I thought, my gosh, I've died and gone to heaven. Anybody can cook like that, a daughter's got to be a great cook. <laughs> How did you propose to her? Well, I asked Mr. Davis if I could uh, ask for his daughter's hand in marriage, and he said no, that he didn't uh, want me for a son-in-law. And so uh, we talked about it in great detail, and I think probably he realized that uh, I was very persistent, and Peggy had made up her mind, and probably the smart thing to do was to bless it, which he did, and stood by us and was a very good friend. I remember when he proposed to me, he proposed to me, um, it was toward the end of the spring, sometimes in the spring, and he would be graduating in June. And he came over to the dorm, and uh, he got down on his knee, and in the front room, the uh, social room uh, at West Hall, and he got down on his knee and was sitting on the couch, and he said, I'm not very good at this, but would you be my wife? 
and I started crying. And <laughs> I don't know what he thought when I started crying, but I gave him a big hug and said, absolutely. I said, of course, if Daddy says it's okay. So he had to go and ask Daddy. And uh, when Daddy said no, he came back to me and he said, uh, he said no. <laughs> and I said, well, what'd you say back? And he said, uh, I didn't know what to say to your dad. But it, Daddy thought about it a little bit, and then he went back to it. I would have married him without permission, and I guess that would, that would really be the first thing I had ever done with my dad's, without my dad's permission, if he had said no. I graduated in June, and uh, one of the things that, that happened, my mother and dad, I, Bob called them and asked them if they would come to his graduation. And um, Clinton came and he brought Mama and Daddy to the graduation. And uh, then they came on to Savannah. And Bob was going on home. His folks were there. They invited him to come to Savannah. And um, they had a nice visit. And I think Daddy was very pleased that he had said yes, but he did ask God that for us to wait, not to get married for a while, to let me get more education. So those were our plans, that I would stay in school that uh, and, and get as much education as I could, and uh, then we would get married. And I'll let you carry on about how our plans changed and so forth. Well, as, as you may remember, during uh, 1951, uh, we were at war with Korea. And the minute I graduated from college, they, my neighbors decided that I was now 1A. And even though I had applied for commission in the Coast Guard and the Navy, the draft board kept saying, sending me notices and saying, uh, you know, if I was not accepted by the Officer Candidate School of either one, within the next 30 days, they would draft me. And so we kept putting it off one month at a time. And finally I got my last and final notice that I either had to be accepted in OCS by whatever the date, I'll report to the Army. And the day before the final, I got accepted by the Navy and took it to the draft board. And then the next day I was accepted by the Coast Guard, which is the one I really wanted to go into. And so then I ended up uh, having to go to Newport, Rhode Island for 90 days to go to Officer Kennedy School, and that's when we decided to go ahead and get married because there wasn't any sense for me being up there for 90 days and Peggy being in Swainsboro or Savannah or wherever. And we had an interesting, uh, shall I say, right before marriage time. It ended up, I believe, that uh, Christmas was on Tuesday, right? That year. And anyway, the, the day before Christmas, we went down to the county courthouse to get our license and we fill out all the paperwork and everything and move along and all of a sudden the clerk said, wait a minute, you can't get a license here. And we said, why not? And said in the state of Georgia, but the problem with the license came to light when we went down to the courthouse at uh, Chatham County, Savannah, and we filled out all the paperwork and all of a sudden the clerk said, wait a minute, you can't get a license here. And we said, why not? He said, in Georgia, you have to get it in the county of the bride. And so we got on the phone and called and nobody at the courthouse would answer because it was afternoon of Christmas Eve. And finally called uh, Mr. Davis and he went to a judge or somehow or another, he got the license. And I teased him about it for years that he was so anxious to get rid of his daughter that he wanted to bought the license for us. <laughs> and uh, the other thing that happened, which was interesting, we caught the bus to uh, Swainsboro that afternoon and went up and visited with the Davises. And on Christmas Day, uh, Paul and two other people, I don't remember frankly who the other two were, insisted I go hunting with them. And we were walking along, saw the line of rest, and a bird got up, and Paul and one of the people swung around, I was in the middle, and blew holes in the pine tree right above my head. <laughs> That's when I made the decision that I would wait in the truck until everybody was finished hunting didn't think I'd want to go hunting with those people anymore. And then we were going back that night to Savannah 
and we got to the bus station and the bus was just jammed. And so they let everybody who was on the bus get off and have a rest break. And Peggy and I were standing there talking near the bus and we saw this guy walking towards the bus and I think I commented that he looked like he was having his Christmas cheer a little early because he was staggering real bad and when he got near the bus he put his hand up against the bus and blood just ran all down the side of the bus. And that's when we realized he uh, had his head cracked open. He walked around the bus station and somebody told him to give him his wallet and he refused and they hit him over the head with a piece of pipe. And so we gave him first aid until they could get the ambulances there to haul him off. And he bled all over my new sport coat and uh, that was the end of that one. We don't wear that one anymore. <laughs> And then we came back to Savannah and we got married at Sacred Heart Church and uh, Inman either on purpose or by, uh, by being too excited got lost between Thelma's house and the church and Peggy was late and I figured she had stood me up and uh, we had a, a very nice wedding and then uh, Thelma and Ben were really nice to us and invited everybody over to their house to have some refreshments and while we were there, some of the uh, family were trying to decide where our going away call was because they were going to decorate it. And uh, we hinted that it was uh, Rita Bremer's brother who was single, mm -hmm. Joe Bremer. And, yeah, explain uh, that, who Rita Bremer is for anybody who doesn't know who Rita is. Uh, Rita came to work, uh, came to live with my mother and father before I was born and lived with uh, them until my mother passed away. And her brother, who was not married also, uh, had a nice car and so we figured everybody was going to decorate the car so we sort of hinted that was the car we were going away in and people decorated up they're just married and a whole bunch of stuff and Joe really got upset about it. <laughs> you remember that? I do. Backing up a little bit Judy, uh, I'd like to to mention a couple of things. Um, we were able to get married at that time. We really had no money to speak of. Bob was working for Crane Plumbing Company as in the accounting area um, while he was waiting to go into the Navy and didn't make much money. And I was still in school. I had worked at Learners over the holidays. But before I had gotten there, when I was still doing final exams for the, for the semester, Bob appeared at the dorm one day and said, he was so excited and he said, guess what? He said, my mother asked me what I wanted for Christmas and I told him that I wanted to get married. And she said, okay, why don't you? And he said, I can't afford to. And she said, well, we'll give you like $2,000 or whatever it was. And Becky spoke up, for Rita, and spoke up and said, uh, and I'll lend you my car for your honeymoon. And so he came up real excited and he said, we, if we could afford to get married, we, could we get married over Christmas? And I thought, oh my goodness, I have to tell my family. And I was afraid to tell everybody and it didn't go over very well. Um, but the wares were so warm and so loving to me. And the day of the wedding, Ben Powell cooked breakfast for me and he cooked me a great big bowl of oatmeal and I just hated oatmeal and I said to him, <laughs> he kept saying, you've got to have a good meal. On your wedding day, you've got to eat a good meal. And I just hated oatmeal at that time. I've learned to love it. But I sat there and tried to get that oatmeal down and it had a hard trip going down the gullet. But uh, on the way to the wedding, I kept saying to Emma, hurry, hurry. And I guess in his fashion he was trying to hurt. But I had asked Daddy to give me in marriage and Daddy said he couldn't do that. And so I asked him because I had so much respect for him and he said, okay. And so he drove me from Thelma's house to, to the church at Sacred Heart. But on the way, in his hurrying, he went down a one-way street going the wrong direction. And we got stopped by a policeman and we had we had a hard time trying to explain to him that we were late for a wedding and that we needed to go. Emman says he doesn't remember that, and I think that's uh, selective remembering, <laughs> but um, at the wedding, which was in Sacred Heart, there weren't that many people in such a big church, but 
Mama didn't go to the wedding, and later she told me many times that she regretted it. Um, Clinton and Juanita did not go to the wedding, but everyone else had come. They were there, but not everybody looked very happy that, to be there. And um, But over on Bob's side of the family, everybody had big smiles on the face, and they were real welcoming, and I, that was a wonderful welcome into the Webb family. I think you got to look at it from a perspective that's, you know, it's probably pretty true. The Wes were glad to get rid of me and the Davises were glad to get rid of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems interesting to me that that it, it got off to such a shaky beginning, but that now that you're tight with all of them, Bob. I, I think probably over time I became as close with Mrs. Davis as anybody did. She and I became really good friends, and uh, I think really one of the reasons was that uh, we were more alike than perhaps even my mother and I. You, know, you probably don't remember this, but your grandmother used to enjoy uh, jokes and laughing and that kind of stuff. And I can remember, you know, she'd be doing something, she'd be visiting us, and, and I'd start off and I'd go, uh, Lizzie Dalcita, what are we going to have for dinner? She'd say, my name's not Lizzie Dalcita, it's Miss Dew. And I'd, call Miss Dewey and then a little while later I said, Lizzie Dalcita, are you going to put the piece? She said, you call me Lizzie Dalcita one more time, I'm going to chase you with a butcher knife. <laughs> and the kids would just laugh and scream and they were egging me on and about the third time she chased me around the table two or three times and we just had a good time together and enjoyed uh, being together. And I think probably one of the other things that I admired most about her is she never corrected Peggy or I. Uh, as you probably know, raising children yourself. Not in Judy. front of you, she didn't correct. Well, that uh, none of us did it right, but uh, Miss Davis never said anything. She never said you shouldn't correct the child or you should let them eat their dinner or you shouldn't let them eat their dinner or anything else. It was always whatever we said was okay. Now, Peggy says she got on her later, but she never said anything okay. any one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. She came to visit you, I know, in, in, when you were in Birmingham. Right. And she came and stayed with y'all in Jacksonville when you lived in the house that had the little two-story thing. Right. It's, and she it's came it's to the big house, the seven bedroom, five bathroom. Yeah. Yes, uh, we had some nice visits with Mama, and um, I don't think Daddy ever got that far because he wasn't traveling at the time. But our first little apartment was so charming. It was so small. <laughs> this and was it, in Rhode Island? No, okay. this was in, in Savannah because Bob did not leave for Officer County School until March. And the plans were that I would going to school. I was going to enroll in, in Armstrong and I was going to continue my education. And I also got a job. So, and I didn't know how to cook very well. And <laughs> you tell us why you didn't know how to cook. I didn't know how to cook because Mama would never let me cook. Mama would make me wash the dishes and all the grunt work. And, but she didn't like anybody messing with her cooking and, and you know, it, I could observe, but I couldn't. I couldn't do anything. So I had never really learned to cook. Bob's mother taught me more about cooking than I had ever learned because I knew I had to learn how. Um, this little apartment was so was so charming. It was very small. It was an apartment. It had a living room and a a kitchen with an eat-in area and a bathroom. And but it was like heaven because it was ours. It was all furnished and. We had really enjoyed our three months there before Bob had to go to Oxford Candidate School. Um, you going to tell Judy about the, the blessing of the house? I think you could tell her about that. <laughs> uh, Peggy and I were married, of course, but uh, she was not a Catholic at this time and didn't really know a lot about the traditions, I guess as you call them. And so we asked the priest that married us if he would come by the apartment and bless it for us sometime. And he said, yeah, he just dropped by. Well, I was away working and uh, somebody knocks on the door, Peggy goes to the door and there's uh, Father Raymond. And he said he came and blessed the apartment. So he's blessing the, the living room and he blessed the bedroom. And he opened the door. He sprinkled holy water. Holy water. So he opened the door of the bathroom and there's Peggy's underwear all hanging all over the bathroom drying. And he said, well, I think I better bless them too because they're important. So he blessed her underwear. <laughs> and after we had eight children, I thought, well, that priest, I'm going to have a child with him. Oh, Remember that? then you went to Rhode Island? 
I went to Newport, Rhode Island, to also Canada School, and Peggy stayed in Savannah with my folks. And then uh, nice school. the reason, of course, for that was that in OCS, and I didn't know this when I signed up, you only got to leave the base from noon on Saturday till five o'clock on Sunday. And the rest of the time you had to be at OCS. But for the last month, Peggy came up to uh, Newport and we rented a room with privileges which meant we had a little room and we had the use of the kitchen in this house. And there was another OCS wife and husband there and uh, this elderly lady. Excuse me, we shared the bathroom, the bathroom. bathroom. that's right. And uh, both of them were expecting at that time. And so the girls all got together and talked about having babies and whatever. And one of the funniest things I remember when we were flying from uh, Providence, Rhode Island to Savannah, we get on the airplane and this little girl uh, her husband had driven their car down to uh, Pensacola. He was going to flight school, right? And so she was flying down, and we hear her call it, Peggy, Peggy. And Peggy turns around and says, what? She said, you put the seatbelt over the baby or under the baby? And everybody on the plane just broke up laughing. <laughs> and we were expecting Michael at that time. So um, then where did you go? Well, we, I went up to join him, and I, I got That's to stay. You left Rhode Island, that's what you Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I got to go up for a month, and we I stayed close by, and he could only come home for an hour, uh, half a day on Saturday and spend part of Sunday at home. But when he graduated, we went back. I stayed. We had a little vacation together, and then I stayed with Bob's mother and dad. I was expecting Mike, and I stayed with them and continued to work for a while. And Bob went to Guam. That was a nice experience. That was a nice. We we like Guam very much. We go back to Guam today. I kept trying to get IBM to send us there. We have an office on Guam, but they didn't want to do that. But uh, one of the cutest things about the expecting Mike, uh, the doctor that delivered Mike was not a uh, OBGYN. He was a uh, family doctor. And he kept telling me that I could relax, I didn't have to worry about anything on Guam, that women have been having babies for thousands of years, it's no big deal, on and on and on. And his nurse and I had gone to school together, so we knew each other real well. And he was going through that routine one time between the time I graduated from OCS and the time I left for Guam. And she was standing in the door listening, and she said, listen to this guy talk. Let me tell you what happened. He just had his ninth child. You know what he did? His wife called and said, I'm on the way to the hospital. And he flies over to St. Joseph's to be there while the baby's born. And after the baby's born, the wife's okay and the baby's okay, he goes out to get his car and it's gone. They called the police and reported that his car had been stolen. And the next day, he drives a rental car to the office and there's his car at the office. He left his car at his office, ran to St. Joseph's Hospital, mm -hmm. and then called up and told him somebody had stolen. And he said, now this is a guy telling you to be calm and relaxed and all this other wonderful stuff, right? But Bob went to Guam and I stayed until Michael was born because I, I was not allowed to travel. And Mike was born October the 23rd, um, two years after. We had first met. Mm -hmm. it, 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 two years after our first date. So that's a very special date to us. I wondered how you could remember when you had the exact date you had the first that's date. That's one of the ways I can remember exactly because we commented at the time. But what kind of pay did you get in those days? I was making about $6,500 a year, if I remember correctly. Plus, uh, we had a housing allowance and uh, a food allowance and whatever and of course the Navy paid for all the medical expenses for Peggy and I which was yeah. very nice and, and this is 1950 52 uh, when I got out of the Navy uh, four years later I was making like seventy nine hundred dollars a year if I remember and uh, went to work for IBM and the end of the first full year I had doubled our income and I remember Peggy and I sitting around talking about what are we going to do with all this money? I mean, we, we don't need all this money. How are we going to spend it? And, you know, it was $14,000 or something in 1956 with four kids. And we thought we were just rolling in money. You save more money then than we do now. <laughs> then later oh, on, we had a good job. Peggy, 
How many years have y'all been married? You've been married 50, 50 December. And there were some predictions made to you that when uh, we were going to get married, uh, some forecasters in this family said uh, it won't last a year. It won't last a year. And I just love to put that number 50 <laughs> up because it's well, I've lasted 50. How many different homes have you lived in in that 50 years? We've had 17 different homes. In but you had those before your 40th birthday, right? Before your 40th anniversary, excuse me. This is the seventh, yes, we did. Uh, this is our 17th home. And We've the first one we years. ever built, first first house we've ever built, uh, we have uh, existing, well, we had two new homes, but we didn't build it. And uh, I want you to, uh, to give your advice to the younger generation about how to stay happily married all this time. You've seen the, the advice that your brothers and sisters have given. Well, I certainly agree with uh, what Renette said. You have to have a commitment to each other. You have to have a commitment to to marriage, what marriage is. And um, you have to, marriage is not just a two, but marriage is a three. -two. And I think the spiritual element uh, is crucial. And God has always been present to us and with us and in everything we've done. You agree? And that is a very important ingredient to, to, to know that you can't do it all by yourself. Um, we've had a very good marriage. Um, that sarcastic, smart aleck little <laughs> boy, that old man who, uh, whom I met, I changed my mind about him, uh, that character that I didn't like very much. And I said, uh, they're a very, very happy marriage. Uh, he never promised me a rose garden. <laughs> Neither did he promise me eight children, but I am delighted I have every one of them. I would not send any of them back. If I had changed anything about that, I would, uh, I would spread them out a little more so I could give some individualized and you individualized uh, care to each one. Right? Judy, one of the things that I would recommend to young people today, particularly young people starting the family, and it's something that Peggy and I tried to do, and, and frankly, IBM helped a lot, was to always have time for each other. Maybe only once a year, but uh, we would usually get uh, some time off, maybe four days or five days, and we would go to the Golden Circle, or we would go on a trip, or we would uh, just go down to the beach for the weekend, or whatever, and just be by ourselves. And I think that was very important, because as you can imagine, with eight children, you were working and taking care of the kids, and you know that took about a thousand percent of your energy, and you didn't really have a lot left over for your loved one. And I, I think that's an important thing for young people to think about. The other thing I would like to share with young people that there are a lot of things that will happen in your life. And I think a lot of times people focus on how bad those things are. And I think really you ought to focus on that there are a lot of things going to happen in life and those things should be looked at as they're being sold. In other words, they happen. Now what you do with them makes them either good or bad. And to give you an example, I, no one in my family had ever been to college. And if I had not had messed up my knees playing football, I would not have had an opportunity to go to college. And had I not met the controller at Armstrong Junior College, who got me a job at Georgia Teachers College, I would have never finished college. And had I never finished college, I'd have gone into the Army and been over in Korea. Maybe I'd have been shot, maybe I wouldn't, who knows. And if I hadn't gone to uh, Georgia Teachers College, the most important thing in my life would not have happened. I would not have met Peggy and not fallen in love and had this wonderful 50 years with her. It's hard to follow that, Peggy. It's a lot to follow, but there are a couple other things I would like to, uh, to leave for the young people. It's, uh, gosh, you made it hard. <laughs> Is that um, you, if you think you're not going to make any mistakes, and you think you're not going to have arguments, and you think, you know, everything's going to be a bundle of roses, you're wrong. And if you go into marriage like that, you're going to be very disappointed. Uh, you're human beings. 
your individual your individual people. You've got your own personality and you have to blend them. And our personalities were a lot different <laughs> from the fact that he didn't like me. I mean, he didn't like babies, and I, I didn't like me. And so we had a hard, hard time uh, <laughs> getting our lifestyle together, uh, just just individually. And um, But there's so many things with your children. Love them. Love each other. But love your children. Tell them you love them. Um, I think that... Uh I don't remember who gave it to us, but somebody when we lived in Birmingham gave us a cross stitch that we had for many, many years, and I can't really remember where it is now. But it said the greatest gift a husband can give his children is to show them that he loves his wife or their mother. And I think that's a great advice for anybody. You know, you can talk about all the other things you do, but children learn by example. And if, you know, you talk about you should have respect and you should love people and all that, and they don't see that happening. They are not stupid. They figured that out pretty quickly. And they realize, you know, that uh, you're talking out of one side of your mouth, but you're doing out of the other side. The other thing I, I would suggest that for a new couple, um, for old couples too, is, is not to have a child-centered home. A child-centered home is the worst thing, and usually a marriage won't last when you got a child-centered home. And a lot of people are raising their children today like that. A home is a complete circle of family. It is not it's not a child with the parents just playing attendance. It is it is a circle. And if you make a child centered home, it's it's not gonna work for anyone, especially for that child. Um, and I my last bit of advice would be that to love and to love a lot because love begets love and certainly um, the one who loves the most will forgive the quickest.